It's the Almost Perfect Podcast. Welcome to the Almost Perfect Podcast, a celebration of fuck-ups, failures, and falling flat on your face. This is a podcast that believes you can learn from experience, but that experience doesn't have to be your own. Ha, I'm both perfect, and I'm a functional fuck-up. Let's learn from somebody else's mistakes. And today we're learning from Mojak Lahoko. Now, Mojak is a comedian, he's an actor, and he's a musician. Although, I didn't know so much about the musician thing before we, before we had this chat. Like, I've seen him post stuff on Instagram and that, but it turns out uh, Mojak's got uh, some deep history in the South African rap scene. And uh, we, we get into it on this podcast, we discuss that pretty early on. And in general, you're going to learn a lot about Mojak that you might not know. Maybe you know it. Maybe you listen to his podcast. Oh, yes, he's another. He's a podcaster. <laughs> he's got a podcast called Tell Us More. It's a pretty good podcast. I enjoy it. He doesn't have that many episodes up just yet. But uh, the reason why this podcast you'll listen to now sounds really good is because we actually recorded it on Mojak's equipment at his house. So I really, really am now amped to try and get uh, some new microphones and uh, make this a bit better but that's happening in may uh in may we're going to be improving the rig here uh at the almost perfect podcast so if you don't like the sound in some of these episodes i'm sorry but uh, at least you know that you only gotta wait until may until it gets a bit better and if you want to help contribute to that you can go to patreon.com forward slash almost perfect That is where you can subscribe to this podcast in more than just, you know, subscribing on iTunes or whatever. Uh, You can actually pay money uh, to listen to this. If you want, if you want, it's totally up to you. But yeah, go over to patreon.com forward slash almost perfect. And occasionally I do giveaways over there. I give you the opportunity to suggest guests. I do put it out there that, hey, you want to ask these guests questions? Go ahead. Uh, Although people haven't taken that opportunity too much lately. Uh, They still... They're still there though, so I appreciate all of you who have signed up to the Patreon account, and I appreciate all of you who are just listening to this podcast, that have subscribed to it, that have, you know, left comments, left reviews, done all the things to get it out there, because this is our year, baby, 2020. Uh, It's two weeks in, and I feel like I've been doing a pretty good job, like, I've read like three books now, which is pretty cool, I've gone for runs, I haven't eaten meat yet, Uh, I think that's going to continue for quite a while. So yeah, man, I'm I'm, dig- I'm digging it. Not much work though, but uh, we're working on that too. I sent out a CV this week, so big things uh, up in Bob's life in 2020. How you doing though? Are you 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 hitting your goals? You making things happen for yourself? Hope you are. Uh, and if you're not, well, get on it. You know, there's nothing to it but to do it. That's been my motto for a long time, and it's how I've managed to get a few things done in my life. I'd like to still do more, and uh, yeah, this year is going to bring plenty of that. I'm not going to talk for too long here today. I don't have much to say to you. This one's coming to you a bit late because my electricity has been out for like the last 16 hours, uh, but it's back on now, so I was able to charge up. I'm going to quickly try and get this out there uh, before the electricity goes off again. So once again, thank you for listening to the Almost Perfect Podcast. If you enjoy it, go over to Facebook. You can like the Almost Perfect Podcast there. On Twitter, we are almost underscore podcast. And like I said, you can also go to patreon.com forward slash almost perfect. Other than that, subscribe. If you Whatever you're listening to this on, hit the subscribe button. And if you're on iTunes, if you're on Apple Music, I'd greatly appreciate it if you left a review and uh, a comment there. Just saying, or ratings and reviews. Uh, it does help us go up in the algorithms and all of that. Also, if you enjoy the podcast, share it. Just hit that share button on your social media application of choice. That's it. That's uh, that's the intro today. I got nothing else to say to you. Here comes the almost perfect podcast with Mojack Lahoko. So how are you living, Mojack? I'm good, man. Taking it easy. The year is almost over, and I'm just trying to trying to wind down and just try and enjoy these last few days of the year. That's my plan. That's it. That's all that's really happening. Yeah, it seems like it because I've just come to your house now. You, yeah. You're jamming some uh, Call of Duty Modern Warfare here. Yes. Nice Friday, just chill day. I spend a lot of time here, bro. I don't. I, I almost don't leave the house enough. Okay. I try to. I try to make the the crib like as comfortable as possible. So I know there's a lot of machines here, but like I got the studio in the other room, which I like still make beats on sometimes. But yeah, the idea was that 
how can I be in a space that I don't have to leave or has all the shit that I like? That's kind of the idea and philosophy around yo, what yo. you're seeing. Yeah, I'm trying to develop that with my place at the moment. And I'm also mm. becoming way more of a homebody. Like, yes. As I'm getting older, it's nice to venture out and do work and yes. like do that stuff. But then it's also nice to just go home and not see anyone for like three days and just like... Yeah, I love that shit. That's my favorite thing. I'm like, I'll just sit here. I'll read. Maybe I'll just watch shit on YouTube. I'll watch some Netflix shit. Um, I'll try write and make stuff and make sure that I'm in the mix. Um, but yeah, I don't, I, I don't go out as much as I used to, which I'm fine about. I, I'm, I'm trying to start doing like shit that I haven't done before. Like, make that more of a priority. Okay, so what kind of shit haven't you done before? Because you've done a lot of shit. We'll get into what you yes. have done soon, but like, yeah. I mean, you know, like, weird shit, like, just, like, maybe go hike somewhere. Okay. Uh, but I think I like the idea of a lot of shit more than actually doing it. Yeah, I like the idea of hikes way more than I like going on hikes. But actually, sometimes, yeah. sometimes it's cool, but like, a short one. Like, yeah. Like, let's just go chill by a waterfall, have some snacks. Yeah. Like, let's go walking for 10Ks into the mountain <laughs> and camp there overnight and yeah. that sort of stuff. It's like, I don't walk anywhere, which i mean it's, i mean it's joe but yeah, so that's, but, that's the weird thing about you you can't uh, yeah there's nowhere to kind of, i mean there's a park not too far from him but what am i gonna do in a park you know it's like a grown-ass man playing on monkey bars and shit so that's why that's why i play soccer like once or twice a week to get those those runs in and also like it also gives me an opportunity to kind of like socialize yeah and de-stress also i'm quite hectic on the soccer field so but it's the only place where i'm like that Normally, I'm a bit more laid back. Yeah, you're a super laid back guy from my experiences with you and from my understanding of you. So that's quite interesting. Well, I thought I was laid back. I'm not sure anymore. I think <laughs> I think this year has been interesting. I think my laid backness is an attempt to like really suppress like the possibility of just like just raging. <laughs> what are you raging against? No, I think I just I'm like sometimes I just get frustrated by stuff and the the way to have it not spill over is to try and be calm and placid. And so over time that's like a mechanism I've developed, but I also can like sometimes something will really annoy me and I'll like get upset really quickly, but I I've learned how to kind of deal with that over time. What sort of stuff gets to you cuz yeah, like from the outside it looks like you're living a pretty good life. I well, I just don't like you know what really upsets me is like when simple shit's not done properly. <laughs> like I'll tell you, this is really dumb. Some people are like tuning out already, but <laughs> but I so I buy stuff on Amazon, right? Um, How with the with the import duties and shit these days? It's not that bad. It's like two hundred bucks on certain items. Okay, it's, you're you're buying different things to me. Yeah. I'm getting nailed on that shit. <laughs> yeah, so basically. So it's, they're all credit card purchases. So I'll check how much an item is. Then I'll check how much I've got on my credit card. And then I'll move money into my credit card to make sure that I have sufficient funds. Recently, I make a purchase. The next day, I get a text from my bank saying that my credit card's been canceled because I had insufficient whatever. So I call them I'm like, what's going on? Then they give me a rigmarole about if you transfer money after 6 p.m., it takes an extra day. But the purchase is immediate. So I'm like, yo, bro, you the bank. How do you not know like how your own mechanisms work? So that kind of, <laughs> I know it sounds really silly. So we're talking like, first world problems here. Yeah. I mean, it's not first world. Well, yeah, but it's like you, you should know how these systems work by now. You're better than this. That's what like I'm frustrated by, that kind of shit. So it's nothing, no no real issues at the at this point in your life. I mean, they're real for me. I mean, I got other shit that frustrates me, but I, I just, that was just an example of like, I, I Some just, of the main shit, mundane shit that gets you a little Yeah, frustrated. I, 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 I'm frustrated by people who can't do, like, perform basic tasks like capably. It's like, you, know, you, you should be able to do this shit at this level. You know, because banks are not mom and pop stores. It's not three <laughs> people like fucking uh, doing mag tape transactions like in the lounge while someone's knitting jerseys as a side you know like I don't know, that feels like a good back-to-back -back <laughs> what a mom and pop show it might be so like might have less stuff stolen from you like julius malema probably had like a mom and pop shop going <laughs> with his bank well i mean i wouldn't you know mom and pop that's like how how would you earn interest on that shit it's like <laughs> it's just a ponzi scheme basically <laughs> what you're talking about is herbal life <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> herbal life for bags yeah network marketing and all that shit uh, so yeah. 
So what have you been up to this year? Because like I genuinely don't know. Like you do so many things. Like you're like you're on TV. You've got your podcast. You've sure. been making music. Make, making music was a thing you kind of started this year or last year or like. No, no. I well, I, well, I start with music. I, I I used to rap in high school when I was about like sixteen. Okay. It used to be like ciphers and all that kind of stuff. Like that was the era where you had to like really freestyle, where somebody would give you a topic and yeah, then you and had to, to you had to stuff. spit. Yeah, and that was like our thing. Um. And it was fun, you know, but I think I got to a point where I was frustrated because I couldn't make songs. Like, you could battle rap, but I wanted to put out actual music. So when I was about 16 or 17, I asked my dad to buy me um, a Casio. It was called, it was called like a CTK 600. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, uh, and it had like basic programming features, but it wasn't still quite what I needed. So then I've, I, I, a friend of mine got me like a bootleg version of Fruity Loops. So I started on Fruity Loops. I had to save money to get a MIDI controller because it was like, you know, MIDI to USB. But I started making beats kind of when I was 16. That happened for a couple of years. When we were in varsity, a good friend of mine, Wade Rose, and I, I had this big idea, this grand idea of having like, of being like the next Neptunes, basically. Okay. And, and like, like Kanye's line, make five beats a day for three summers. I deserve to do these numbers was really big. Like we would spend like fucking hours and hours in his lounge like with a pile of cigarettes in the ashtray because we were like <laughs> searching for a sample or for the right like kick drum or snare hi-hats like flipping samples reversing them chucking reverbs on them then pulling samples like so anyway i did that and then and then in university we used to go to um an, uh, uh lanster of ghetto rough they used oh, to have a, they used to have an office uh, next to asc the academy of sound engineering um next to sabc so we had i don't know how we had met like bongs and Deleuze and all of them and crazy lou at the time rest in peace and uh so we would go there to try sell them beats and they really liked the beats the problem is that like they had an in-house producer and bongs is classically trained he's like fucking good he can score stuff yeah. and like that's what he does now isn't it yeah well i'm not sure i haven't seen him in eons but the point was that like people weren't why would you buy beats from some upstarts when you got an in-house producer who can make every genre like bongs was literally everything out of get rough i think at some stage was kind of going through him malik was there at the time teba so the beats I, I pushed back for a while um like he just drew up in names <laughs> no no it's like because I, I no, but it's interesting because yeah. i didn't know this about yeah because like when you started putting your music on um Maybe instagram, instagram and, stories, and stuff like yeah. that yeah i was like damn this guy's pretty good and i thought it was something like you had just started doing like as a side thing from like comedy i didn't realize you actually started out in music yeah i mean it's uh the weird thing is that because I, i'm using different um digital doors digital audio workstations the workflow is different like so i started on fruity loops then i went to reason by the time like i i had i knew reason backwards like at some point like there's if you hit tab on reason everything turns and you see the back of all the consoles so the like and you can rewire them manually to like imagine an old rock and roll studio yeah. where they had all of those racks you can do that in the software like we could do crazy shit in reason stop that move to logic try this native shit and like they're just eating my money because the money's not in the hardware it's in the plugins yeah so like every two weeks they're like hey we got these new uh violins and it's like i don't really need violins but yeah, go back to fruity loops man i can't the fruity loops was cool but it, it was tinny at the time but i know it's a lot better now like oh yeah it's, way, it's, way, it's, way. yeah it's professional now and i work on mac that's another reason why i don't use fruity loops oh what was the, the question is what have i been up to this year <laughs> making beats one we've covered that um i guess stand up a uh, bit of tv stuff it's, it's been a weird kind of transition here where it, it almost feels a little bit like i'm in between two phases of my career if that makes any sense sure because yeah that's kind of how it looks to me almost like yeah like i don't know if you've been busy this year in comparison to other years uh yeah i mean i've been i've been relatively busy but like quiet about it okay sure you're not like telling everyone your business yeah like i just um we did this commercial recently and one of the co-stars were like she tweeted about it and then she put out photos and like i was supposed to send her the, the pics i took on my like camera like two months ago but i, I just wasn't bothered so <laughs> I've, i'm doing stuff but i'm i think i'm not posting as much about it i'm, I'm 
But it's I, also because this life's now your life, like the TV thing, the comedy thing, the, you know, being a person in entertainment, it's no longer like new to you, it's like your job. Sure, I mean, but you know, I'm, but you just highlighted something that's interesting, is like that can become a dangerous thing also, where, where like, you're not happy about the stuff you're doing because okay. it's, it's just part of your daily program. So sometimes we take, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Like we, we don't fully acknowledge the stuff we're working on because we kind of, we're constantly focusing on the next project or next idea, 100%. which is good as an artist because you want to like progress and be better. But then we're robbing ourselves of the opportunity of being like, yo, I did some dope stuff this year. Like I had to remind people this year. Like that they, they won Ovation Awards in Gramstown. <laughs> like I had to tell, and that wasn't long ago. That was like- A couple months back. Yeah. I'm like, you won an, an award at the biggest arts festival in the country. And, and I know like we, like we don't live in the past, but it, sometimes you might just give yourself credit, you know, once in a while. Yeah. I've got this thing of like, I won't ever pin like a tweet that get like gang numbers. Cause yes. it's like, I always feel like my best works ahead of me. Yeah. And like, I don't want to like- rest on like you know like that one good tweet that i had once yes like and i feel in general that's what all comedians that like i meet well not all but a lot of them you know i yes. like that it's like yeah i did this thing but like i'm working on this thing <laughs> like yeah. it's like i want to get ahead i want to we never feel like the stuff we've done is as good as like the stuff we're going to do almost. sure which is which is true of some people and wrong of others. <laughs> some motherfuckers is peaked no um no i'm just <laughs> i'm talking shit but i think i you think, didn't mention names so you can say that no 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 i'm not you know i'm also trying to reset my energy this this in these next few months but i'll, I'll talk to that idea of like we are we are focusing on the future the, the key is kind of not to be content with what you've worked on or have created in the past and that's a good thing in terms of your work. It's the dangers in like like just being hard on yourself, and again yeah. not acknowledging like the stuff you've you've done and having some perspective. Like going, where was I six months ago? Where was I a year ago? I had this chat with um, Kate Pigeon like recently because I was like, she was, we were just chatting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was just saying a lot of people rob themselves of the opportunity to to acknowledge the cool shit that they've done because they're looking towards the future, which is important. But once in a while, like celebrate yourself because these motherfuckers aren't going to do it for you. Like award shows come once a year. Like, and, and even your fans. And the awards are bullshit anyway. You know, well, that's, you know. They, they go, have, go listen to the, the uh, live from the Winston if you want to hear my I feel like, wasn't I there? Was I there that day or was that a different podcast? Yeah, well, I don't know. If, were you there for the one where we were just talking about the Comics Choice Awards? I know there was one with uh, Carvin. Carvin was me, you, Carvin, Neil. Yeah, I can't remember which one you were on. But yeah. Yeah. Anyway. yeah. Um, yeah, like, you know, even all of the people out here who've got fans, like, or maybe only a small percentage will openly tell you, like, they love your work or how yeah. well you're doing. And so if you're looking for that validation from the world, it's going to fuck with you because it doesn't come with that frequency, particularly when you're not super famous. So sometimes um, look, look after yourself. Have you found yourself looking for that validation from the world? Like, is that something when you started out that you wanted? Um, you know, like... Stand up in the beginning was a bit strange for me because uh, in 09, when I was kind of starting, um, there was a show called So You Think You're Funny. Yeah. Uh, but that was on TV, yeah. Yeah, that was on TV. David Gow's. That was a bit brutal. Uh, yeah, it was interesting, you know. But it has got some great alumni. But th the point is that at the time, Paul Pops was a contestant on the show. He came second that season. But I've known him, Paul Pops, It'll be 25 years now. Him and I were in class together in the second grade. You're older than 25? I am, man. It's, uh, it's all this cocoa, but no, I'm aging terribly. No, but, but, um, but so, so I seen Paul Bob's on this show. And him and I kind of link up in 2010, you know. And basically, I started going on the road with him, Chris Mabane, a bunch of other comedians along the way. And what happened to me is that I was in close proximity to comedians who were doing really well. And was maybe at the time frustrated that I wasn't getting the same opportunities. That sounds relatable. Yeah, but but what I wasn't ex acknowledging was that those people had done the work to get those opportunities. I was just in. That the sounds relatable. <laughs> well, whatever, however you view it. But like I was there. I think I was a decent act, but I hadn't done the stuff that they had done. But luckily, early in my career, um, uh, after working with like with with uh, like Kagi and and Gola and a, a bunch of guys, a, a gentleman by the name of. Tek Takunda Bima, who ran a company called Podium. 
He's not the guy doing Joburg Comedy Festival. That is the same cat, okay. yeah. So Takuna at the time managed... Um, at, at one stage, it was Trevor Noah, Eugene Koza, Kahiso Ledeja, David Kibuka, and Lois Okola. Podium, podium with That's a, kind of like the, you know, the Mount Rushmore. Of like, course, yeah. Uh, which, probably. like, I mean, a lot, of, a lot of people don't talk about often enough, but that was his roster. And then, and then Tall Asmo and Robbie, like... Damn, as, so yeah. he, had, he had a good life of talent that Yeah, day. he had a hot fire roster. Anyway, TK one day sat me down... Um, uh, so two people told me very important things. TK said, your journey might take a little bit longer. You remind me more of like Kibuka than the other guy. So just be a little bit patient. Um, when it clicks, it will click. It'll work out. But just know that it will take you a little bit longer to kind of get to where you're going to get. A friend of mine, Sivene Loloana, said the same thing to me when I started. He said, it may take you 10 years to reach any kind of like real success. And so... I've tried to be patient with my process. I've been frustrated a lot. Uh, this year was a tough year for me in terms of not like where I think I should be, but I think the state of... If, if we had to do a state of the nation of stand-up comedy and we all stood around in parliament, this, this would be the year where I'd fly kick a bunch of people. I feel like a lot of people feel that way. Like yeah. the conversation I've been having up here, it seems like comedy is in a very weird space. Like... I mean, a lot of places have shut down in terms of, like, gigs and that. And, yeah. like, there's a lot of new kids on the scene who don't seem to have much respect. Like, this is just what other people have said to me on that. So, mm -hmm. like, and how is, but, like, how is that affecting you? Well, it's tricky, you know, because, like, new comics are a byproduct of the system. And they're necessary. Yeah, they're necessary. I, 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 yeah, I never dispute that or, or ever. Like, th there should be a new group of talent, first and foremost. Secondly... The, the generation that comes after us should not have to go through as much shit as us. Sure. I think one of the things I've noticed, the thing I'm willing to take responsibility in the game right now is to go, look, we created this room. Lois Okola created this room, Kitcheners. It was a new material night. In 2012, he handed it over to us. I, one, didn't, I didn't know he created that. Yeah, that was his, that was him, um, that was his room. He gave, he gave it to myself, Robbie. Lazola and Aref, or maybe to Laz, and then he kind of brought us in. I, I forget how it went down, but anyway. Um, I think what we tried to create was an accessible space where new acts could come and play. It was, it's not an it's not a open mic night, it's a new material night, yeah. but that also allows new acts to come on. And I think I think we didn't rule with an iron fist. You didn't? Yeah. We didn't rule with an iron fist. We didn't curate. We went hard on people for not keeping time for not being punctual and and, and 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 maybe that like i'll speak for myself there's been times where like i haven't been there on time so like it's hard to blame people for not being punctual with you when yourself you know what i mean like I'm not, I'm not saying it was that like that all the time but i think those in retrospect those may have been some of the things that crept into the industry not just our room i think in general in like general there's because I ran, well, I ran underground comedy in Durban based off of Kitchener's, basically. Yes, yeah, yeah. Uh, like, I came up here, I, like, I'd stopped comedy for, like, two years, I think. Sure. And then I did this thing at UJ uh, for the creative conference thing. I was sure. part of it. Simi was hosting that. Yeah. And he was like, yo, come to Kitchener's. Yes. And then I did five and it was killer and I loved it. And then after that, I was like, I need to take this back to Durban. Yeah. <laughs> and then I tried, but, like... I faced the same thing of like lack of curation. Like I was, sure. I was trying to just give everyone a chance. Yes. And so audiences, you know, suffer <laughs> when you do that essentially. And also like comedians didn't necessarily respect the room or respect me or respect, have respect sure. for what was going on. And I mean, that's why I eventually shut it down. Yeah. But like, is that similar situation that's happened with Kitchener's? Well, I mean, you know, the other thing I also like, again, just to be clear, like Kitchener's is also a fire room. Yeah. It's banging. Like, you know, like, Nobody must get it twisted. That it's my favorite room in yeah. the country. Jeff Ross played uh, fucking Kitcheners. Will Sylvins played there when they came for the Comedy Central International Festival. Brakao's there. Lloyd Goyla plays there. A lot of acts have written their shows of Bob playing that there. room. Yeah, you play that room like, you know, 40 weeks of the year. You do, excuse me, two to three minutes a week. You've got a new one, man. Like with a, with a, a cool audience. I think... We had great successes along the way. Where I mean, it's still a banging room. It's still rad, man. It's still cool. I mean, but there were times where we had like we had we had like waves at Kitchener's, like the mad rowdy audience. Yeah, then those we, are my favorite. Well, I we weren't big fans of them because we we didn't want to have to play principal while doing stand up. So we were like, 
where we were trying to discipline people and entertain them at the same time, which is really weird. It's like the mom who beats you and then says, I love you. I'm doing this for you, kind of. <laughs> you know what I mean? Okay. Like, so, but but then we then we got to a point where the audiences were self-regulating. They were telling each other to keep quiet. Like, we no longer had to do that, which for me is a great moment to go yeah. like, oh, you get what this thing is. You created like, the culture now. Exactly. So, th so there were some positive cultures that came out of it. But look, for the most part, quite frankly, I had a good time there, man. It's been seven years or so. Seven good years and... We'll see what happens, but it's been fun, and I think I think. What is it in danger of? It's not in danger. I just think that the South African landscape is like in a bit of a, a transition phase. We're going through growing pains, like, and I think every generation has like a bubble, you know, like shit. There was a lot of there was a lot of money in this shit like a few years ago, and this last year, yeah, and there still is for the right people. Um, yeah, and that's the tricky thing about stand up it's is becoming like, the right person. Yeah, that's the hard thing, man. Which is. It's hard, and I don't think it's just stand-up. I think anything in life is... A lot of your opportunities are about access. Yeah. Like who you know, who's on your team. Who likes you. Yeah, and I think, I think the weird thing about stand-up is a lot of people are talking to the wrong people, right? So, <laughs> and, this, and what I mean by that is like... Stand-ups are trying to convince other stand-ups to give them opportunities. It's like, yeah. no, these, you know, these motherfuckers don't cut no checks. We're yeah. all doing all your deals. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like, speaking to the wrong guy. And I think that's what I kind of realized this year was like, I'm I, I messed with Tats the other day. I, we did a gig on Tuesday, and it was a group of comedians sitting down, and we had a great time. It was fun. But at a table next to us was him and his like, dance family. He's dance, like the people he dances with. Tats dances. He does, man. He okay. does. He does. He'll do like his Kuzomba things and he'll, they'll have socials. And, but w when I looked at it, I was, and, then, and, then, and then the next day I was having my year in with the guys I play soccer with. I was like, a lot of us don't have families outside of this. So that's why sometimes it becomes our whole world. Oh, we're literally just talking about this with Kate and Ryan. Like yeah. I, and and I, I feel like I feel it's tricky because I feel like I spoke to them recently. So I've been I've been like fucking doing this. Be some crossovers. Yeah, it's inception. I've, I've planted a few seeds so, and I'm trying. <laughs> I'm trying. It's like that happens though in comedy. Like you find yeah. like conversations like happen like that you know yes. someone like they become like a regular point of conversation for like that month of everyone's talking about similar topics and similar things while going through like because one person will say this another person will say that and then it becomes the theory yeah which is the other danger of like being within your own environment is it comes insular yeah my dad has this idea of like it's called intellectual incest Yes, 100%. You don't yeah. get exposed to new ideas. You yeah. don't. And so you always think you're right. You always think the people... Because it's the same thing that's happened now. Like, literally, so today that we're doing this, I'm not sure when this will come out. Sure. But Boris Johnson just got voted in. Mm -hmm. And people on my timeline are shocked. Yeah, which is fucking silly. You'd be mad dumb if you think Boris Johnson... Like, if that that him being elected is a, is a surprise. Yeah, because we're all liberal and we're all in our little, like, you know, bubble. And so that then becomes the narrative to you. And so when anything sure. goes outside of that narrative, you're like, how the fuck did this happen? I think it was the same thing with Trump. And I can, yeah. yeah, so when you do have these small frames of reference, when you do have these small communities, you do become quite insular. And, yeah. But you're finding this year you've expanded beyond your comedy friends? Not as much as I would like to. I'm slowly like, I've had a bad year of just like not, not like wishing people happy birthday and like doing like... Oh, I stopped doing that years like ago. Like friend shit, you know what I mean? So I think I'm, oh, in, yeah. a, I'm, I'm in a lot of people's dog boxes this year, I'm, you know, and I'm, I need to text them all and be like, sorry, I fucked up. I'll see you soon. But I, I think there's value in, in having multiple families. That's what I'm trying yeah. to say is like, you can have your music family, your comedy family, your fucking skateboard family. And they all have different ideas, different beliefs, and have like different desires for each other. And it's good to have like some kind of sense of reality because you know, like, you know, like we're sharing ideas with people who work fifteen minutes a week. I mean, an, or like a night. It's like, fuck <laughs> off, man. Like, you're not. Like, this shit is not reality. Yeah. This shit is mad twisted. Like, I get it. We like these artists and whatever, but it's like fucking talk to a real person and it's hard for us because like you know how comics are we don't want to meet strangers and shit and it's also it's like so this is this is a thing when people get really good at comedy or mm. really successful they become rich they become famous and sure. their friends are rich and famous people yeah and so their material starts becoming more and more unrelatable yes like as people get like 
like I found like Dave Chappelle's new special to mm. be unrelatable to me and like I sure. didn't necessarily enjoy it. So I thought Bird Revelation was fantastic and the yes. stuff he was talking about there was like stuff that I could relate to. Mm. But then when he's talking about his rich friends and like stuff like that, I'm like, uh, yeah. I'm not really on your side. And then like that happens. I think Chris Rock's kind of suffering from that a little sure. bit at the moment. And is that like something that you, you've worried about at all? Like that's, you know, your frame of reference, if you become too insular, it means your material's going to suffer almost. Not really. I've always been unrelatable. So that's a, <laughs> that's, that's an easy obstacle. What to do you mean you've always been unrelatable? So do you just make yourself relatable on stage? Because I watch you do comedy and you seem like the most down to earth, relatable. You're like, because you've done a lot of hosting. And like, yes. So you're very personable on stage. Like sure. You, like, you come across as someone you come across as someone's buddy almost yeah i mean you know i'm so there's two things there right like first of all i think for me i've always consumed stuff that I, that people consumed at a different time or that's just like not in their frame of reference like 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 i love reading this there's a few books here mm -hmm. and so like my first oh wow you got amy poehler's book up there yeah it's really good she's got a great she's got to be like before she's got a great phrase in that book where she says know your currency she said she was a good looking blonde woman and um she knew that people would have treated her differently because of that but she decided to be funny so like that you see like that's the great shit i like about reading because you get that insight yeah so and i know like i'm personable on stage but off it i can be like a bit the word's not cold but i'm i'm not on sure but i'm like yo man i'm when i'm on stage that's when i'll show up when the cameras roll that's when i'll show up when i say when i say like um unrelatable like I, I just consume stuff at different times to people so like i'm reading noam chomsky now and for me like they'll be funny in that what are you reading um should, what's it called i forget the chomsky book because i just finished the land is ours which is i know it took me long whatever but whatever chomsky book and there's, there's a couple of other things like born anxious um i read them in high school like which was like so above my head like i read so yeah. much stuff in high school that was above my level because of like rage against the machine <laughs> oh yeah uh, zach de la roca and those cats yeah yeah so i'm so basically i just consume stuff at different points to other people and so i when i started doing stand-up i'd like read the mail and guardian i thought that was comedy like you read mail and guardian and, and then, then you, you come up with jokes yeah but, but no one else was reading mail and exactly guardian. you're right so i'm like yo man what a what about the energy crisis? Am I right? It's like, yo, you're at the underground on a Sunday. Shut the fuck up, dog. Tell us about, like, you know what I mean? Tell us about I find smoking that relatable. weed. But, well, you, but then at the same time, you learn to make that relatable to audiences. Well, right? that's the point. That's what I learned over time was to go, okay, here's this idea that I have. It doesn't exist in your world. How can I, like, what do I have to do to make you understand what I'm saying? So that's been my kind of my journey over all these years is to go, here's this ridiculous idea i'm gonna explain it to you in a very simple term and and then like i think i decided that my stand-up because people are always like what's your stand-up like and uh, it's so, a hard question to answer here i do know now okay. yeah i i sell sophisticated ignorance <laughs> cool that's some copyrights like right there yeah well it's like it's from a yay line so sophisticated ignorance right my curse is in cursive right so the so the idea for me is like trying to take sometimes more complex ideas and then using like really fucking simple or like mad dumb language for you to like relate to it i'm feeling like i'm in a similar position like with my show the end of the world that i've like done i've you know done tons of research i've like done mad science like you know reading and that to try sure. and figure out a lot of stuff and like the challenge there is how do I like, so there's this thing called the paperclip maximizer. I don't know if yeah, you've ever heard about no, it. It's, no. it's about it's a general artificial intelligence sure. that we create that its only purpose is to create paperclips, but it needs to create the best paperclips and in the most efficient way. Yeah. And essentially by doing that, it develops ways that destroys the earth, you know, like it turns, like it takes all the earth's resources because yeah. like, it's only thing is to do that one thing yes and so to try and explain that in a joke like i turned it into uh the dildo maximizer and then of like yeah make it like <laughs> so that's the thing like i find that to be also be a challenge but also find that to be the fun thing like about comedy is that for so long and early on in my career people kept on being like you know the circle of reference stuff like yeah. try and say to talk about stuff that people know and yeah. like i felt like that was so unsatisfying for me it was just sure. telling jokes that people could immediately relate to like a part of me bringing people into these interesting ideas that, yeah. that they've never even come across before and explaining to them in a way that makes them laugh and that they can go home and like think about it sure it's always been like something i value immensely and like it seems like that's something like you 
on, well, personally? Well, I mean, you know, like stand-up's not so loaded for me. Like, you know, like people used to be like, you got to have a message. It's like, oh, man, these are, yo, you're hiding your message behind 13 dick jokes. Like, <laughs> it's have some fucking context out here. Like, you know, like. Your first job is to make people laugh. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and so, yeah. And actually, that's what it is. And and so I've, I've I feel less like what's the word i'm more precious about the act of stand-up like i just write things that i think are funny like um or just simple ideas like i think when i you know when you're doing a one-man show though like how does that correlate because i mean i think we all do that like we just have our jokes that we come up with and then also sometimes have stuff that we're willing to like write about sure but so like in general sets you know that's always a lot of the stuff that you're just coming up with throughout the week yeah but then when it comes to one man show how do you develop those when the one man's a different so every 18 to 24 months for the last what maybe six years so that's only three or four shows deep but i will do a one man that was that was the initial thing with my first one how did i get you then after that my subsequent shows were based on um either working in a new format or or trying to uh, improve a skill that I thought I lacked. Okay. So my first uh, show outside of stand-up, How Did I Get You, was a show called Rewriting History. I've always been fascinated with history, but I wanted to present the show in a way that felt different for me and challenged how I did stand-up. And it was hard because people don't... Like, a show about history is hectic because a lot of people don't know, like, the, the, the minutia, like, the the really great details. And so that that becomes even harder to make funny. But I was like, cool, let's test yourself, bro. Let's go. Yeah. How can you make World War One funny when you know the realities of that? You know what I mean? So that's tricky. It's like, you know, like jokes like um so that, that's why I live in like this absurd world of like, hey, Shagazulu was a great leader and he also had time to build an airport. You know what I mean? It's <laughs> like you know, I'm like I'm massaging motherfuckers into like I like that. You know what I mean? Like into 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 the world of history. So that, that show I did, I, the, the preview I did at Pop Art was like really trash um, because I was all over the place. Like I had cue cards, a podium. I just didn't know what was going on. But the preview was great because it showed me that I had holes in my show. Anyway, fast forward. Yep. I do the show in Grahamstown. I've got an easel. It's very interactive. When I get to religion, I say to people, what are the commandments? If they go, thou shalt not check. That's what we write down. That's the truth. Like, that's, like we go, that's the... We don't correct anyone in the show. We, and so, so I developed that skill over like eight days. Um, I just recently did a show called The First Time, which is a show, a storytelling show, because I don't think I'm particularly good at stories. I know how to write short bits and then crowbar them together to create narrative. Sure. And I've also been like really good at doing that with other acts. That's kind of what I'm wanting to do going forward. What, producing? Directing. I've been, I've been, I think I've soft directed a few people's shows in the last few years, but now to like, you know, put my fucking name on it. Um, uh, but yeah, so, so, uh, the first time is a collection of stories about first time experiences. So, so it's, it was something difficult for me cause I'm not a story guy, but it had to have a hook too, to make it different. So I'm constantly just trying to put myself in, in spaces where like we, like Put yourself in a hole is kind of my philosophy every 12 months to 18 months. Like, like if you don't write this show, if you don't start fucking working on this, you're going to crash and burn. That's kind of my philosophy. Um, unfortunately, the shows don't, aren't seen by as many people as I would like. But <laughs> I feel like every celebrity comedian has that issue. Yeah, I mean, but that one, I think that's my fault. I, I think I've picked really shit venues over the last... Not shit venues. I've picked inaccessible venues. Like, I think what we're not acknowledging is like, we live in a in like a moral culture and society, so people want somewhere with a food court <laughs> and a, and parking, like right. And yeah. so we just make it hard for our consumers sometimes by trying to pick like these what we think are really niche, cool places, but they're like it's like just some people just think it's dangerous, man. Yeah, I mean that's been the biggest issue, like with the venues I pick in Durban. Yeah, people are always like. You know, is there parking? Is it going to yeah. be a car guard? Like, I've literally had with the Winston people drive there, park, mm. not get out the car, yes. and then drive away. I, that <laughs> happened with that. So, we were working on there's this there's this new comedian, uh, South African guy who works on the Daily Show, but um, new comedian. No, I'm fucking around, Trevor. <laughs> so one uh, time, because <laughs> I was gonna say like I know another guy. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm just talking about mad spicy. Anyway, Trevor was back here in the lead up to his dome show, 
and he was trying. He was looking for places to work on the bits. So we were so he had a couple of gigs lined up, private ones, and then we they were, we were trying to organize like um, public gigs where we, where like kind of get people to turn off their phones and shit and like let them play and we were doing whatever work we were doing and um and i think the one day he pulled up to kitchens and he was just like not a fuck <laughs> 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 and uh in his defense he's right like <laughs> yeah i mean robbie got stabbed outside kitchener so yeah so exactly enough. yeah like what was why <laughs> even though sometimes i get to kitchens i'm like what the fuck am i doing here like i have no business here i'm grown now i'm like trying to my tax returns again like i shouldn't be here man <laughs> like but there's no place it's still the dojo like it's still the place yeah i mean the, it's one of those places where like inside you now nah, even inside you're still unsafe but <laughs> like <laughs> you're you're kind of safe in 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 that corner that in, in that block that is the comedy yeah. that's what we can control uh, fuck outside of that it's a big thing we've tried to kind of address but anyway i don't want to focus too much on that yeah but the point is that so I do these shows every 18 months. Uh, I throw myself in a creative hole and I go, how are you going to get out of this, bro? Start writing. And I always leave it too late, but I also realize like, I, that's your process. Yeah. And I can kind of write a show in four weeks, to be honest. Like it won't be the best version of it, but I can write a show in. But that was me this year for the end of the world. I was just like, I'm going to, I picked a topic. Mm. Like I had a date because it was like the festival. Yeah. And I was like, well, now I've got to do it. Sure. And then half the stuff I did for that show, I had never tested. Like yeah. I just went on stage and did it. And most of it worked. I was very, very happy about that. And like the same thing where it was like, I'm just going to put myself in this hole, in this challenge. Because my first one, man, was just material that I had. Yes, yeah. And like, I like, I love doing that as well, but it's so scary, man. Like what? Uh, one man. No, they're putting yourself in holes that you have to dig yourself out of. Like, but at the same time, you, you kind of know you've got it. Well, for me personally, like, sure. But at the same time, like, don't you have those fears like that? You are going to fail at this thing. Yeah. I mean, but that's what pushes me. It's like comfort is a weird thing, man. It's really tricky. We spoke about earlier about money and being rich and being famous. You have to like, I kind of live my whole life not really fitting into any group per se. Sure. So, so my life is inherently one of discomfort and uh, attempting to assimilate or, or 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 figure out a group of people or a place. That's so that's been like from from like six years old, you know. So the thing is that that's almost my norm. And it's like, I don't know, I, I said this so many years so ago. you're like, comfortable with discomfort? Yeah. Or, uh, yeah. I think I am comfortable not knowing, not being sure, being uncertain. I'm fine with failing. Like, I, in high school, I played, I remember going to, like, play squash. And the first fucking day, they put me against, like, the under-16 Gauteng champion. <laughs> and, um... And for me, my rule has always been like, I'm not competing with anybody. I'm just trying to be a better version of myself. So I Amen. said, I'm going to give a good account of myself here. The guy gave me a, a hiding, but he was also like, yo, you, you put in an effort here. So, so there's like, there is value in taking a loss. Definitely. Like, but, but, but it's, it's brutal it's, when you do it on stage. <laughs> that's fine. But it's like, it's, it's the way in which people lose. Like there's, you know, the, there's, there's a, a graciousness in, def, in, in, in like losing when you've put in an effort. I don't mind like lo like, and I'm I'm gonna keep using sports as a reference. I you I love somehow, your well yeah, I'm, I'm a big fan of all of them. Um, Esports, no. Um, but I remember. Well, no, yes, you are into esports as well to a degree. You've been at Comic Con and stuff, but we'll chat about that. Yeah, as that's now. another story. But but for instance, like I did cross country in high school. I was a sprinter in school. It wasn't like I was always just outside of. We're actually quite similar. I did cross country in primary yeah. school. Yeah, well, cross country is a little bit different for me, but I could always do the one hundred and 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 so I. But I'd always be like sixth in the gray or the the age group. So just always on the precipice the outside. So I was like, let me try this cross country shit. It's not my style, but let me do it. Um, eventually, I got to like running a forty minute eight k, right? Which ooh, five minutes a k, nice. Yeah, but which uh, across terrain and when you're young is very good. Yeah, but remember, 
when I was running competitively, I was the last runner. So in my world, I'm doing great. But if I compare myself to other people, then I'm really shit, right? But I was never competing against them. It was never about them. But you was just per- that's the cool thing about running though, is it's a personal best. Yeah, but I'm but what I'm saying is that like those philosophies can exist outside of just like fucking sport. Like I think I think that's the one thing I I did enjoy about sport and like is pushing yourself to the next level. And they're conscious decisions you, you can make. Everyone physically has certain limitations, of course, sure. but sometimes mentally you decide what that limitation is. And so if you go, I'm going to fucking run a marathon in, in 12 months, people do this shit all the time. I mean, that's not hard. Well, a year for marathons, like you just stick to the plan. You got okay, it. Okay. So say I'm going to ride with one man every year. There you go. It's fucking, you just got to stick to the plan and do it. Like it. So the shit's not that difficult. And, but I, I've always kind of tried to do shit for myself, but it's hard because there's a lot of things happening and. You can't get distracted. It's just important to go like, what What the fuck? Why are you doing this? Like, I think we don't ask ourselves that. In terms that. of external things, like all... Just like, whatever we're doing in life, like, why are we... Why did I start doing stand-up? So why did you start doing stand-up since you brought it up? I mean, it was like uh, some, some cats I went to school just made a bet with me. It was three of us. And they were like... And it was a weird bet because there was no money. There was nothing. It was just like a, you know... I don't know what it was, but it was like, hey, I bet... I bet us to do stand-up, whatever the fuck it was. <laughs> And so I called the underground and I was like, hey, can I get a spot here? And they said, cool, we'll chuck you on whenever. At the time, there was a lady there, her name was Alicia Whitworth. Okay. And uh, she was like, yo, come play. So I do a spot and it's like, it's not bad, it's not great, but it's it like, it's, I'm not the worst on the night for a guy who's never played, <laughs> right? And so Alicia calls me like a week later. She's like, hey, we'd like to have you back here if you're keen to come jam. And I'm like, oh shit, yeah, of course I'd love to. But the experience was really addictive. Like, it was exhilarating to be on stage and have like a hundred people in this low ceiling room. Yeah, the underground was nice. It was fucking amazing. Just it's like still one of my favorite rooms because yeah. it's just seats and a stage. Yeah, it was fucking amazing. It was one of the first places I kind of watched live local stand up. It's where I started my stand up career. It has a lot of great memories where I met Lloyd Cole and John Fliss and Robbie and. Um, it was my local room, man, and, it, and it, it felt like home when I played there. It was like I had met every version of the people who were sitting in the audience. Okay. I was like, they, and that happens to me a lot with stand-up. Whenever I walk out somewhere, I'm like, oh, I've seen a version of you. <laughs> like, I rarely get nervous because I'm like, I know. I've met a, a Nicole like you somewhere, you know? Um, so it's like, yeah, I can do this shit. What, what the fuck are we talking about? Who cares? Uh, we're going to get into your hosting skills because mm. you, to me, are maybe the best host, like, in terms of, like, regularly doing this thing. Like, as, yeah, like, so. in, in comedy, like, I honestly, I, I rate you fucking highly because you're adaptable in different rooms as well. Like, some comedians are good at, I mean, I, I haven't done, seen you do corporates, yeah. but I assume you're pretty good at them, judging well, by how you fuck do Fuck shit up at them corporates. No, I'm not. That's the thing. <laughs> I, do okay, right. I do good, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I do good. But I see, um, yeah, like I see with the way you host other gigs and that, so, you mm. know, from the box to Kitchener's, which sure. are two very different rooms. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of other people get caught up in the corporate comedy and then they bring that into other rooms yeah. and they like struggle with it. And I've seen you just, every time you like, I've never really seen, well, I mean, I haven't seen you that much, sure. but I've never seen you die sta- like doing hosting. Yeah. And it's the one job in this country that people die a lot at and it's horrible. Yes. So how did you get so good? Um, so again, this, I, a lot, the, the ability to host is from being able to rap, right? Okay. Because when you rap, first of all, you you are you're making shit up, right? But it also has to be coherent. It has to rhyme, and it has to be on the beat, right? Yeah. <laughs> like, so by the time I'm getting to hosting, where I'm like, oh, I don't have to rhyme, and I don't need to be on a beat. I'm like, yo, this is piss, bro. Like, I can just make shit up. So was it always easy for you? Wasn't always easy. My first set of hosting was at Wish in Melville, and my first link was Hot Fire. Uh, the next eight uh, were garbage. Um, 
it was bad. Like I really bombed that night. Uh, like uh, to the point where people weren't making eye contact with me. And <laughs> what comedians or the crowd? Comedians, oh, everyone, oh. everyone. <laughs> just whoever was there, patrons. Oh, I think we've all been there as staff. comedians. Yeah, yeah. Where you um, just want to go home. But you're like, yeah, it, it felt like the people. But were you sh- got to get back on stage and introduce the next act. Yeah, I'm, I'm bombing for three links and I got four more to go. You know, and. Uh, <laughs> What's funny is I'm still not the worst host to ever play. Wish anyway, that's for another day. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> I'm eating shit, and um, I just went like, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna. That's not gonna happen to me again. <laughs> like, just made a decision. But but improv improvising, I think we all have the ability. I just had to hone it over time from doing stand up, and I think I've always been quick off the cuff with like people saying shit and making jokes, and then o- over time you learn certain tricks like. Like I never pointed audience members. I always asked them a question with an open underhand. Okay. It's more inviting. There's small things about body language a lot of people don't know. Is this from your reading? Just reading and talking to people who like, you know, it's like if you, someone said like Barack Obama always has his hand clenched in a fist, but his thumbs on top of his finger. index finger. Yeah. It's like a very neutral, but yet powerful thing at the same time. You learn how to ask neutral questions. You learn how to like... Oh, the one thing, this is someone, maybe I don't give enough credit for this, but John, John Flissmus, I watched a lot at the underground. He was really quick, sharp. Mm. One of the things John said was that if you're going to make fun of people, make fun of everyone. So that's also been a big rule I've had. I'm like, if you watch me host a gig, I'm going to chop everyone down. The reason for that is that nobody feels isolated. They don't feel like they're being picked on and bullied. So then it feels like, so by the time I get to someone, the whole crowd's like, yeah, well, he said that shit to me too. Like, you know what I mean? Like, they're active participants. I'm actually pitting them against each other. Whereas, like, that doesn't happen all the time in comedy. Like, sometimes people pick on certain, like, parts of the audience. Yeah. Like, yeah. The other thing John told me or someone else told me, I'll give it to John. You can have this one, Fliss. Um, <laughs> He's not going to listen to us, yeah, don't worry. okay. I forgive him. No, but, <laughs> but someone always said, you never make fun of someone's, like, actual physical features. Yes. So I believe in that so much. Yeah. So I I always make if you got if except you wear, for hair, except for hair. <laughs> hair I'm kind of I'd leave. But if you're wearing like a bullshit cap or some dickhead Ed Hardy jersey like you're going to get it, bro. Like uh if you if you made a conscious choice to look like that. Yeah, man, if you're wearing a collar shirt but the button stop at your fucking midriff like my mans, I'm going to tell you. We're going like, to talk about that. You know what I mean? So there was just le- certain tricks I learned over time. I learned to to listen also and i had to also make a decision to go that the show's not about me as a host that's very important yeah a lot of hosts don't do that and like i even like when i host sometimes get into that thing of like oh, i want to do it a little longer yeah you guys are lacking me maybe i should carry on but then i'm actually like bro let your ego go like you yeah. you got the big laughs it's cool bring on the next person yeah i mean it's i mean it's tricky man it is fun and that, maybe that's sometimes the thing that frustrates that had frustrated me for a while because i hosted a lot so it was like and not to sound like a like a fucking martyr or anything but it was it did feel like sometimes i was busting my ass and people just thought like it was all them like when they oh, walked they, yeah You've, you've warmed everything up. You've got the crowd ready. Yeah, and, man. And it's nice and toasty for them. Yeah. And they get on and kill. And then they think like... Yeah, man, I ate shit. I was fucking on while people were eating burgers, bro. <laughs> like, like, getting in their first orders. And I'm not saying it's all me, but like, I... you And uh, I'm not... But that is one of the aspects of hosting as well, is that you do have to do that. You do have to like, eat the shit like, yeah. of the audience and like, get them on board. But you're not the focus. Yeah. And I've also been like, I've had to learn also over time to never give up an audience. If they don't like me up top, but they like the acts, then that's fine. That's because it's so it's about the show, man. And I think I'm I'm always gonna revert back to sport. It's very simple. It's like if, if you're doing an ensemble show with five acts, it's like a it's like a fucking basketball team, dog. Just play your position. Yeah. If you're the point guard, then dish the ball. You know that's what the MC kind of is, like the the QB, the the point guard. It's like He's creating opportunities for other people to hit their shots and, and making, you know, and, and trying to give you the best shot possible. So if the audience, to, to again speak on sports, if the audience double teams me, but I throw you an open pass and you hit the three, then that's what's important. We won. Yeah. We won. Like. Oh, but not every comedian sees it that way at all. 
like most people i think you know go to a show to just get on stage and tell their jokes and hopefully for them it's they're the best act of the night and everyone loves them in particular like well you know i mean it's also tricky because it's not their fault you know like stand-ups are like a show up and leave economy yeah you arrive at your gig you do your 15 minutes and you bounce you're like you don't have to do anything else it's like of course after a while that's how you're gonna see the thing like most cats are not having to go there and, and plug in a mixer before <laughs> you know what i mean or like or like go oh shit this is an xlr <laughs> I, don't think, I don't think most comedians know what an xlr you know, you know what i mean like, or like yeah. you know the value of an sm58 it's like you know and so so i'm not it's hard man i'm what i'm trying to do now is let go of a lot of the perceptions i had about stand-up about the world in general like the community of it and how the acts are supposed to be and maybe how I think they're supposed to behave because I'm also like getting older. And so like, I think a lot of my, the shit I'm, I'm saying now is like becoming tainted by my age. But also are you criticizing an earlier year? No, I don't know. It's like the space for critique, but I just think like as, as you get older, your voice, your voice just feels different. Mm -hmm. Like, like, you know, I came up in an era where like me and my, contemporaries shout on each other gave each other guidance gave each other love chopped up notes but we're not those young kids anymore we're not quite the first gen but we're in this weird transition phase but i'm really like i kind of don't want to talk anymore to people about stand-up because i do think like my there's like a weird senior seniority that i kind of have and that of course that people are giving me and like i think that's making shit weird man it's like it's really making shit weird well like people have reverence for you and are actually listening to what you have to say now i think they were for a long time but now it's becoming like oh he's like oh he's what's... just that old guy talking shit and i could be wrong but that's just how i'm feeling and so I don't, I'm, I'm trying to like distance myself from because i love having chats about stand-up and I, but i think a lot Every of stuff, comedian does but i think a lot of stuff actually that i chat to com comics about is not actually stand-up it's like philosophies about life like I've had chats with guys about like getting their money right. Like, that's becoming the big conversation at the moment. Like, well, not even that. Also, like, uh, like because well, but it's because for me, like, I mean, personally, it's a conversation yeah. I'm more and more in, and sure. like, it's because for so long we do this thing for the love, you know, yeah. like, and you you're getting your hundred, two hundred bucks, and you're like, why is this not going up? And yeah. So, but, well, I mean, I think you know the the guys before us. I mean, I love Loy a bit. He's one of my favorite people in the world. And not just like he stand up's fucking great, but I've I've spent lots of great times with him and like we chat, we chat, we chat, and a lot of our chats aren't he's, even about. Yeah, stand he's up. all about that like philosophical life. I've only hung with him once or twice, but yeah. it's fantastic conversations. So when we break bread, we're not like just talking about like the social political landscape of South Africa. Sometimes I will say to cats like, "Yo, do this with your money. Like, just protect yourself in this regard, or like put some money away here, yeah. or I'll go for your mental health." Like don't don't be caught up with other people are doing like for instance i don't watch a lot of insta stories i don't watch other comedians insta stories as my friends because i want to know what they're doing but. yeah but in general in general and i think that's like to safeguard my mental health like i fucking do you compare yourself to other people as much as you don't want to i think it's just inherent man like you, you dude like the, you're seeing everyone's life yeah, but like seeing someone's life doesn't mean you want their life. Not like, necessarily, but it, it, it's going to eventually like, you know, the shit, the, the stuff is as intrusive as you allow it to be. Of course. I mean, that's why, like I say, like I've muted most comedian stories because especially from Durban, like it sucks to like see like everyone like living, you know, the comedy laugh because we don't live it in Durban. We've got very few gigs and like it's not the same thing. So I definitely can like look at what's happening up here and get frustrated that it's not happening for me and so well, i've learned to just rather not focus on what anyone else is doing up here so so okay l let me say this rather I, I i didn't watch a lot of kind of people's not stand-ups just people's things in general um and and then and then now i'm like consuming a little bit more but i'm also trying to like you know what i used to do that i'm sad i don't do as much i used to just text people and tell them like they're doing well like just like just let them know that i see them i don't know if that means anything and to some people that that, that may not mean shit but i do know that there may be a handful of people that it's so valuable to have people do that like yeah. for you as well 
so now I'm trying to get back to that where I'm like, hey man, if someone's doing a, some someone like I won't say the name, but just sold out a show in Cape Town, I was like, yo, I gotta let them know, like, big up because I know why they 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 moved back to Cape Town. That's between me and them. I know their reasons, but but it 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 made me happy to see that the shit's working out. Like they made the right decision, and like to be to be honest about all of this shit, regardless of how this all goes down. I think I think the thing I'd like to let everybody know is that we want we want everyone to win. I know it doesn't seem like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean? Like Yeah, like I don't know if I want everyone to win, but I want most people to win. Yeah, okay, not everybody. But some I feel you. some of y'all are trash. Yeah, hello? Yeah, you. Um no, I'm like I'm fucking around, but I'm saying like for the most part we don't tell each other eno- that enough. Like we don't yeah, tell each other man. we're on each other's sides enough. Like Yeah, people don't tell you each other how often enough and i'm and remember i'm not like one of those like happy clappy motherfuckers you know like i'm not i don't think i have a a negative or a happy predisposition i'm in the middle yeah you seem like a realist yeah but i have to constantly push myself to try to be more like not positive but just see people just to go yo dude those videos you're putting up they dope man Yo, that thing you shot, that's dope. Yo, that set you did. Yo, I remember when I saw you two years ago. Yo, look at you. Like, like, just give the people, like, positive reinforcement. You know, it's something like even I learned. Again, I'm going to keep using soccer because I'm, I'm hectic at soccer. And so I expect a lot from people. So often I would shit on them because I expected more from them. So my frustration wasn't that they weren't doing well. It was that I felt like they weren't performing within the scope of their abilities. And so now, like, when I play soccer, somebody fucks up. My new thing is like, hey, unlucky, bro. Get them on the next one. Two cats will be arguing on the field. And normally I would add field to the fire, but now I'm like, yo, we'll get them on the next possession. If someone shits on me, I'm like, okay, cool. What did I do? All right, cool. We'll attempt to fix it on the next run. It's really hard to, like, to be aware of, of, of like, the language we use with people. Yeah. And, and so I'm... And that's why, like, I'm trying to, shit, I don't know how to phrase it, but, like, trying to reset, because this has been a, an intense year for me where I've, been, I've spoke passionately about a lot of stuff. But I think sometimes when you're, like, getting a bit shouty, the point you're trying to make is, like, not heard, bro. We're okay. just hearing the rah-rah. We're just like, fuck me, this dude's intense. And I'm, I'm just, like, I'm recalibrating, dude, and, and telling people, yo, keep doing your thing. Your shit is dope. I, I think I tweeted you. I was like, yo, I like the thing. I know I was late to listen to the podcast. <laughs> Dude, like, so my thing with this podcast, yeah. I know people are only going to start listening to it in like another year's time. It's, sure. a, slow, it's a slow build up yes, of yes. like, I know that. Like, I know yeah. I don't have an audience yet necessarily. I've got an audience yes. that I've always had, like, and that's built over the years with my writing and comedy and that. Yeah. But I never, and also, yeah, like, I never expect, like, other comedians to listen to this or anything like that. Yeah. For me, this is a thing for me that I know will eventually kick off with other people. And I'm looking forward to people going back and listening to these conversations because I find them very valuable. And I think the people I've chatted to are important in South African, in, like, entertainment and yeah. maybe people don't know these stories about them so sure i mean also you know like like jay-z says um on the blueprint it's just what i was feeling at the time so <laughs> it was listening like there's also that context it's like you caught me at a, a, a I, an I, interesting like, think, time yeah yeah i yeah. think i think but a, a good one for me and because um, you've had to think about stuff and like yeah just let's reassess like um like the energies i put out because i think it's like you know when it's, you know when you're a kid and you just watch your parents do shit, and sometimes they're not aware like the impact that it has on you. Yeah. Like like maybe they talk to you in a certain way, or, or you or you or you're like, you know, like kids will be trying to show their parents like a, a thing they fucking during school, and they dismiss it of it or they love it, and that has a big effect. Yeah, like, and your mom's like, "Yo, man, I'm cooking, dog," <laughs> which is weird because she's still doing something that's trying Important, to help. Yeah. yeah. But your thing is like my drawing. I went to the validation. You're right? And, and so I'm like, I'm trying to be very careful about like what I say to people, how I say things to people. And 
Because I'm not trying to fuck with their energies. You know what I mean? Because I want people fucking with mine. I'm tired. Like, this is it. Like, I'm fin- I'm f- I want to nap for a while after 2019. There's a few people who are, whose energies I always want to fuck with. But yeah. uh, th- that's just me. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, it's, it's to each their own. It's kind mm-hmm. of that kind of thing. But I wanted to ask, how did you get into TV stuff? Because you were hosting on MTV. I don't know if you still are. But, like, I remember yep. I remember just turning on TV, like, because I don't have one. But, like, sure. when I'm at my mom's house, she's got DSTV. And, like, I saw you then. I was like... That's fucking Mojang. Yeah. yeah. Um, my introduction to television was uh, Late Night News with Loi Sokola. Oh, snap. Okay. Yeah, that was uh, late 2010. I met Loi at Cool Runnings in Melville, I think. I mean, our first, my first interaction with Loi was interesting. I, I get him now, like why it went like that. I think, I think a lot of people like, just say bullshit things to Loi. <laughs> I, I, I wouldn't envy him like because yeah. of who he is in South African comedy yeah. like the amount of conversations that he must well I think these days he's less a part of them because yeah. he loves his own life but I can imagine a lot of people have come up to him and said some dumb shit yeah I think a lot of people say really vapid things to Loi Kola they just walk up to him and say dumb shit and then expect him to advance the conversation so people would just walk up to Loi and be like Matt bro you tall <laughs> and then not say anything uh, but linger like like mid we were mid conversation and a rando's like have you always been this long dog and um and, what and like another comedian or like just no not comedian just people i think so anyway i meet Lloyd yeah. and it's like um i don't i don't think he's cold i just think he's like he's going through whatever he's going through anyway we we kind of chat a little bit and um he tells me he's playing five aside i'm like yo i want to roll through so we, we end up playing soccer in the south with him and some of his mates from way back and so in the car i say to loy actually even before that i texted loy going yo man lnn is going up against the uefa champions league that's fucking crazy you're going up against what i think is like the biggest sporting tournament outside of this biggest soccer tournament outside of the world cup um you know so we chatted a little bit i was really enjoying the colbert report on the daily show anyway move fast forward a while i say to him can i come through to the show i go to i go to a brainstorm this is when they were how did you have the balls to do that to what ask can i come through to the show we'd already had a sort of relationship okay. like you know like we, we weren't like super tight but we had been chatting and i kind of was getting and to you know knew, him. you knew he dug, dug you like enough yeah yeah and even then i, I, I didn't say can i write on your this show one, just to be clear like i never I never asked him for a gig. I just wanted to be in the space. Like for me, that was a big thing. Like I always wanted to be, my pops always says like when he plays golf, he always plays with people better than him. Sure. Because they make him play harder. They make him step his fucking game up, which is a thing I've always encouraged other people to do. Don't, don't be the best in the room. You're wasting your time. Amen. Anyway, uh, <laughs> I, I, I eventually go to the offices and it's, it's Kachis It's Riyad Musa at the time. Conrad Koch is there, of course. Louis Kohler is the host. There's a guy called Lionel. There's Nim. There's Lindsay Chuta, who's an Ivy League graduate in, like, journalism. It's, like, this really, like, super smart room. You know, Tamsin Anderson's there. Karabo Lidich, I think, was also there. Simon Gumenia. I'm, I just want to say people's names so it doesn't feel like I'm leaving them out. <laughs> Mpeng, probably Once again, there. they're all going to listen to this in, like, five years' time. So don't even stress. But I've covered my bases. No one can ever say <laughs> I didn't give them their dues. But anyway, I sit in the room, man. I'm like super intimidated. You know, these are fucking comedians that I watched either on Pio Monati. Yeah, I PMS watched, was. Yeah, oh. yeah, I watched Call for President. I watched, um, what was that weird DVD with John and them? Oh, the Outrageous. One, okay, yeah. yeah that, that was the one where some shit talking went down. Yeah, it's hectic. So I, I watched all these guys and I sat in the room and fuck. I'm like, yo, I want to say something. But I'm like, yo, I don't know people like that. You know, I'm from... I don't think I'm old fashioned, but I think I'm like, I'm one of those like speak when you spoken to kind of people, unless you, unless you're saying some really wild shit that I got to check you on, I'll, I'll let you finish, you know? So, so I chill in the brainstorm. I leave it then a, a week or two passes and I say, Hey man, like I was at the show, I was in the brainstorm. I'm going to be honest, man. I was really intimidated. I wanted to say some shit and you know, I didn't feel, I didn't, I didn't want to overstep my bounds. And I was like, yo man, come through. Like just, if you got an idea, just pitch it. And so the first thing I ever wrote... That's so fucking cool. <laughs> yeah, the first sketch I ever wrote, I pitched an idea, which which is weird because it's still relevant now, but it was basically a, a profile of Bladen Zimande, of where we go. <laughs> the, the, basically, the, the profile is like, what has Bladen Zimande ever done? Fuck all. And then, like, cut to... <laughs> 
<laughs> the rest of the show. <laughs> like, <laughs> so, Still relevant. Yeah, and uh, I got mad issues to play, but that's for another day. Like, I saw him on a flight once, and I, I was going to, yeah. Anyway, <laughs> so, so, and so we just start, and at the time, you know, Myself and Camilo Saluji, who's now one of the, kind of the head writers in the print, there was a runner at the time. You know, we were like, I won't say the skivvies, but like Milo's job was literally just kind of running around and doing shit. And I knew him from Vitz. He was kind of, I think he might have just finished his master's in like satire or PhD. So oh, wow. We, yeah, so Milo and I, like, we were like the two first young writers of that group. And it was fucking fun, man. Like, those were some of the greatest times Lloyd Robbie came through. Uh, I mean, Lazo and Robbie joined later. And then, of course, the team evolved over time. But that was my introduction to that. At the time at LNN, we, were, we had also... Chris Forrest had been in chats with um, Mzanzi Magic. They were trying to bring out Laugh Out Loud, which is originally, oh, yeah. I think, uh, maybe Darren Simpson and, like, Jeremy Mansfield. I think so, yeah. Yeah. Basically, Mzanzi was, you know, kind of also in a transition phase where they were trying to make this show but have, like, a black cast. Kenneth Nkosi and Rapulana had become the executive producers. They were really trying to shift the direction, kind of give audiences more black voices and what, you know. Anyway, Chris calls us and we were doing this thing called Awajali. We were the improv players. So we learned theater sports. It was myself, Robbie Collins, Mpopops, and Rishlu. Uh, Chris was kind of like the host uh, of the thing. And and so I was in these two weird phases where I was going back between LNN and and uh, LOL and like that was interesting in its own right because it worked really differently. Commercials started coming through, which was like fun. But what, what, what do you mean commercials started coming through? You offered them or you went to auditions? So stuff? we would we would a lot of the stuff I've done fortunately is like people asking for me. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, I mean, sometimes the casting directors will lie and say, "Yo, the client asked for you," and you. You get there and your, your sticker says 123. <laughs> You're like, how the fuck did you ask? 123 people. Yeah, so you asked, yeah. It's like you asked 100, another 122 people personally. Fuck you, man. Don't don't gas me. Or, I mean, I don't know if I should say this, but sometimes they'll bring you in and it's a sneaky move. To oh, just to? To figure out, like, what the performance direction should be. Oh, Wow, I know. I thought that would be to like put you up against someone else who they would actually want, and like to like cut the fees and stuff like that. Oh, that's happened too. I've had that. I had a I had a crazy sh story in 2012 where it was like me and Pop and Popos were the last two for a commercial, and it was tricky because everything was going through one person, but that one person represented him at the time. <laughs> And so I was just like, oh, man, I'm so fucked. Yeah, but anyway, that's, 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 a, that's, a, that's a messy story that I'm not going to tell. That's, it's like, that's when I was like, oh, this shit is. The three of you know what happened there. That's fine. Few of us know what happened. That shit was mad greasy. And I was like, oh, okay, that's how you guys do it out here in stand up. That's when I was like, yo, this shit is not all fun and games. There's a, there's a darkness to, I don't think just stand up entertainment and business in general. Can't just be like, ruthless. Yeah, it's like, it's like motherfuckers will undercut you. But we've moved beyond that. Uh, and it wasn't, it was never about Pops. It was the other people who were handling the shit. He's a good friend of mine. But um, so commercials, Yellow Pages was a big one I did early in my career. I did a massive Coca-Cola uh, worldwide thing in 2012. I was like Shakes Palms where I was, I didn't just do stand up. I didn't just do the commercials. I was doing activations at malls, you know, as like this character. It's like, they were cool because they were always supplemented what I was doing and so that's why I still do commercials now. I'm like, yeah, if, if someone's going to... bills. Yeah, not even pay bills. It's like, it's disposable income. Like, the money for me to get to do what I really want to do. Like, that's why I can... I can put on a show that maybe doesn't do the numbers I would like and still spend the PR money and still do all this shit because I've put some loot away that I'm not relying on this shit. And so, like, the, when I started, Darren Moore said to me, you can't be funny when you're hungry, which I thought was an interesting idea i disagree with it but sure i mean for me it made sense because like you're worried about those things and stuff like that but some people are funny because they're hungry like they start out like like they have this absolute need like they their careers go further in comedy because yes. it's an absolute necessity to them to survive yeah like they have to make this thing work or else they don't eat sure and so that makes them bit like work harder and struggle like and get there quicker whereas like i feel like 
if you're supplementing your income sometimes, yeah. like I've done, like with my career a lot, mm. that you don't necessarily put as much effort into the stand up or you don't focus on it as much as you should because it's not the only thing you're doing. I can accept that. I I, I mean, I can accept both sides of what you're yeah. saying and what Darren's saying. I think what Darren was saying is that some with some acts, there was like a level of desperation that we could all feel when they were on yeah. stage. Where it was like, this person needed this money like for more than what everyone else kind of did. And I've been through that phase. I remember when I, I got, I got, they, re, they let go of me at this company I was working at. And then I, I was like, oh, I'll be a stand up full time. And like, you know, the phone didn't fucking ring for like months. I was like, okay. you know, you like our cell phone towers down all over <laughs> South Africa. It's like, I just hadn't, I just hadn't gone to that point in my career. But, um, fuck, what was I talking about before this? We were talking about Darren Moles telling you. Yeah, it can't be funny when you're hungry. There was something else before yeah. that. Um, but yeah, it's just like, <sighs> shit, I forgot. My mind's melting. But we were talking now. about uh, the money thing. Yeah, like having other things to do. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, how distracting it is. Yeah, I definitely think that's a real thing. I think I think it's tough for some people to compartmentalize and be like, this is, this is, my, this is my acting season. This is my stand-up season. But uh, you can do that though, because like I know some comedians like just like have to be on stage constantly. Yeah, I mean, I I stopped wanting to do that a while ago. Um, you see, because my process is like this: by the time I'm saying something on stage, I've thought about it and ran it through my head fifteen times. I kind of know exactly where it should go. Like, and you're comfortable enough with who you are on stage now. And like, yeah, and not to be weird, but like, I know where the laughs should be. Like, as soon as I write a bit, I'm like, oh, that's, ex oh, that's exactly where the joke is. Like, I don't have to... Um, like, we just did this run of Skulk show, and everyone's in pajamas, and I'm like, man, I didn't grow up in pajamas. We just, like, we just fucking slept in old ANC t-shirts, you know, like... <laughs> You know, they say you are what you sleep. Like I thought of it on the night and I was like, this is going to work. I didn't, I didn't doubt it for one fucking moment. So I, without, you know, sounding obnoxious, I know how to do stand up. I know the act of stand up. I know its mechanisms. I know how to. So you, you don't have to be doing it constantly to be good at it. Yeah. I, I need to do it constantly to, 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 when I'm doing a narrative show, that's an hour that I need, that so I need to do. And look, yeah. yeah. There I need a three to five day run ideally for me because i polish over time through repetition yeah but in terms of writing stand-up i think i write i think i write a lot more than people think i do and i think they also don't ever, don't get to see the they don't get to see the different versions of like the stand-up i do and that's partially my fault because a lot of shows i do i are like fan service as in like i'm playing i'm giving them I'm giving the audience the bits I know they can easily consume. Sure, but yeah, we all fall into that trap. Well, the, well, so I'll do them at certain rooms. Then when I do my show, the people don't see that. Don't see the other version of what I do. Okay, like your club version versus... What, what the shit that it piques my interest. The, the first time, rewriting history. So that's like... That, that's the thing that frustrates me is like... Do I, do I, should I start bringing this version of me into the other world? But then, but then just, everyone must just be aware that when I MC next time, you might come on cold as fuck when I do a 15 minute set about gender. <laughs> or is it going to hate you? Which is maybe that's what I need to do actually. I think, well, I mean, you say you like to throw yourself into uncomfortable situations. Yes. It might be worthwhile doing that, bringing the stuff you really care about into hosting because hosting isn't necessarily where you get to, you know, tell people what you really care about. Yeah. Well, that's why I started asking people to do spots and be like, yo man, I can't. I do. I, I really, this year oh, was... Oh, yeah. I was going to ask. Like, yeah. So you're known as a host. But, yeah. like, do you get to do spots that often? I do, I do do spots. And, um... But, but... MCing has really made my comedy disjointed. Like, I'm still, like... Just to be clear, like, I... I'm so... I'm so used to... So asking the crowd questions and being... Personal. And having a bit for them. Like, if there's anything... There's very few times a piece of information baffles me in an audience. Okay. There's, there's very few jobs people tell me and I'm like, oh, I wonder what's that? And I'm like, I've heard it all. You're an oncologist. Okay, the doctor of care. Like we did a show recently where there was a group of doctors, you know? And I said to them, what are you all going to specialize in? And the one guy said, I want to be a doctor of kids. And I said, bro, believe in yourself. Say, <laughs> say pediatrician. Yeah. Like, not, there's few things that... 
But I get why someone wouldn't want to be a pedo. You was. <laughs> yeah, okay. That's where it's from. That's the, <laughs> that is, that's the etymology of the word pedo, of children. Um, for those of you who don't know. You see, Ooh, like... Uh, etymology. Uh, yeah, like the, the origins of the word. So yeah. anyway, the point is that like, I can f- I've been able... It's like even my one man's... I told someone this year, like, there's no set list when I do a one man sometimes. It's like the show ends when my watch beeps. Seriously? Yeah. How? I just walk on and I go, these are bits. The what order they're in, we'll figure it out. Like, we'll... T- and then I go, oh, it's been an hour. Thank you guys for coming through. Good night. Wow. I, That's like... Like, yeah. I mean, maybe one day I'll do that. But for me, it's like, here's the narrative. Here's everything. Like, everything leads into stuff. This goes here. This goes there. Like... But you, and, but you see, again, like, that's because... It's different shows. Yeah. <laughs> We're talking about this shit because, like, you don't want to sound, like, mad, like, bro, I can fucking do... No, but but like, you can, like, and that's fair. So, early, I think early in my career, I learned how to crowbar ideas together. And that's why yeah, when you I... You mentioned I, that earlier. Yeah, that's why I was talking about soft directing a lot of acts. I can watch I can watch a comedian and tell them exactly what order to put all of their jokes in. So, you feel it comes naturally to you now when you're on stage? Like, even with an hour, you've got, like, an hour and a half material in your head and you're just going to work it for that night with what happens there and what feels natural yeah and sometimes it doesn't go well sometimes it is disjointed it's hard to watch sometimes it's like i wish i had a clear idea i do invent i do envy people who who do have structure but i i can find structure for other acts like really well like i can i can see their ideas that may be in like four different places and be and be like just put this shit here right pull that line do that do that do that and I think they'll be, for the most part, they'll be better for it because I, I, I'm not emotionally invested in the bits. I'm, I'm like, what is this like to experience as a consumer? And I'm okay. no comedy. I'm like, that. don't put that line in. You're making it weird for everyone. <laughs> but so it's making it weird for everyone's, like, fun. Yeah, but you're, you're shooting yourself in the foot. You're being a dickhead for the sake of being a dickhead. It's incongruent in how we perceive you and who you are as an individual. Oh, okay, I get you there. Like, there's, like... I love Madinga, and Madinga knows this. Like, some... There's... It's it's weird with Madinga. He's so... He's great at stand-up, first and foremost. Yeah. But sometimes when he uses, like... When he curses, you can it's, feel the audience go, that's not our guy. Yeah, I, I, I imagine that. Which I think I think is unfair and, to and him. I think in, in the podcast we did, he didn't swear that much at all. Like, he'd use different words and stuff because like yes. he might be more aware now of how... People... Yeah, which I think is really unfair to him. But, like, sometimes you have to have a, a sense of self-awareness. I know there's bits I can get away with because I know when to smile. Sure. Like, I know when to... I know when to pause. I know when to tell you you're being a moron. I know when to tell you I'm being a moron. I know when to tell you it's okay to believe in this idea. And so it's like that kind of shit that you just learn over time. And yeah, it's, it's like, it's all very interesting. Like the, this whole fucking journey and like what, what it means. Would you, do you feel like you're South African famous? I don't know. I don't, I think, I think enough. Like, do people know you when think, you walk the streets? Uh, here and there. It's like, uh, but, I th- um, Years ago, I don't know where I was. I was like at a, at a Blacks Only and Kibuka was there. And I was kind of like ego tripping, you know? Like <laughs> Someone asked me to take a photo and I, I said something like really fucked up. Like, oh, this, like, like this is the most photo- famous photographer you could have asked or something. <laughs> and Kibuka was like, yo, don't do that, bro. What are you doing? And I was like, what? And I was shook at the time. I was like, because I was being facetious, but he was right. He was like, don't talk like that. Like, don't be... Like, don't be a obnoxious dickhead who thinks like like you're more like you're self important. You yeah. know what I mean? Like so I I always like walk around assuming nobody knows me. Of course there's certain places where I'm like, of course they know me. I go to I I come here every week. Like <laughs> that's different yeah, yeah. though, yeah. Yeah, but do you know what I mean? Like, but it's just like yeah, with the T V stuff especially, like, you know, you're in people's like rooms every week, then like, you know, they watch you on tv so i can imagine that's got more of an effect than comedy to a, like a degree well i was i mean with mtv for a little bit but even yeah. that was like relative i think like you know it was like five minutes a day it was really weird it wasn't quite like i, I appreciate like the first part of that journey sure the people who brought me in were like they were basically all female directors that worked at viacom at the time 
it was Amy and Tronipo. And like the big reason I went to Viacom was because of them. It was like they were trying to do something different. They created a pilot for the show, which now is is like the the day to day show that MTV does called Newsish. And we were like, yeah, it's a bit of a listical thing. Yeah, of the day. and we were in they were in development with it. I was always the guy. I hosted the first version of it where we'd have like a round table with Tumi, it was Togi T, and we'd have Dr. Maling and like. Unfortunately, the show didn't track as well as people would have liked. I don't think. Really? Yeah, I think. It seemed dope when I watched it. It was fine. It was cool. We did like 32 episodes, you know, which is fine. I, I, I enjoyed that experience. It was interesting for me because I was the anchor of the show and had panelists who I really liked and really had great relationships with. And then. Because you love music and like, you know, you've been in the scene. You've worked with some people within the scene. Like yeah. The vibe. And I like knowing people's stories. It's like why I do the podcast. Like for me, the biggest thing about everything that I do is like. Is, is fundamentally understanding why. Why would you do that? Why did they do that? Why did Why did you book that theater? Why did you take that sneaker deal? Why is this watch made? Like, the why is always more fascinating because I think it gives you a lot more perspective. Yeah. So we were doing the MTV show, the, the, the thing transitioned, it became like a five-minute listicle because that's the second iteration of what Newsish was. So new talent came in. That was great. I'm always on board for new talent. Um... But I think I think what happened at Channel and, and is that I think my voice again becoming the older guy. Okay. I think that's so weird because you're only in your thirties now, right? Thirty-two, yeah. But that's old yeah. in some places, you know. It's like <laughs> it's like uh, it's fucking dog's ears in some places. And so what would happen is I think I was trying to inject my politics into maybe a place where they weren't required. Okay. So like imagine you're doing a listicle about whatever and I'm like, oh man, that's like not progressive. We're judging someone because of her hair and shit. It's like, but that's the model. Yeah. And, and but that's what the people want. You gotta give the people what they want. And so basically I was kind of <laughs> I don't know if I've told the story, but I was basically told that um the station was moving towards more music. That was in essence what it was in that, you know, like they'll try to find somewhere to plug me in and which didn't happen, but it's fine. I, I think they 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 had their next generation too. Sure. So, and I think it was interesting for me because I used to do that show. Like every morning I'd go to Hyde Park at nine in the morning and it'd become part of my daily routine. And then it'd be, it was this weird thing where I was trying to figure out how to do stand up while I had to be somewhere else at 9 a.m. in the morning. <laughs> which is not congruent. Which is like... really weird. Like, But it, it, one of the coolest things is that I'd have shoots on Wednesday after doing Kitcheners at... So I, I come home at like 3 a.m. in the yeah, morning. Yeah, that's shit. It's a moisturizer. Like toasted. Get up at 7.30. Go to go to work. I'm a professional. I'm, you know, for everybody listening, I'm a professional. I don't behave like this anymore. But those are the days when I would do one takes. Those are the days. Also, at, at Newsish, we never had a teleprompter. So you had to memorize everything that came on. You, okay, that show definitely right. seemed like it had a teleprompter. We, never had a, te we never had a teleprompter. So you'd get like... Because, yeah, you're giving real information and it's like written. Like, yeah. So like, that's that's why I was so fired at the Rose Battle. Like, because the, the turnover from the semifinal to the final was 45 minutes. So I had memorized a lot of the shit. Yeah. By the time by the time cameras went, I could do shit like that all the time. I'd be like, they go, okay, the story's about that. That story's, hey, welcome to Newsist. The news never, never knew you knew. Today's story, handed over to my co-host. Boom, boom, boom. And then this is like, I, I always anchored the shit because I was really, I'd learned how to get information really quickly and then lock it down. And so that was also like one of the things I really appreciate about that experience. It was like, there were no teleprompters. We did the one time we tried working with earpieces, which was cool, but sometimes they, somehow they got canned. And, and this whole experience, I know I'm, I'm just, I'm digressing, but talk kind of speaks to tell us more bro <laughs> tune in on whatever platform no um but also like speaks to how we make stuff in south africa and that we're always doing shit with like limited resources <laughs> so everybody's so we've made it normal to have to pull rabbits out of hats yeah and so when you want shit done like with the actual stuff that's required you sometimes seem like a fucking crazy person to go no let's bring in another camera you almost feel like it almost feels like you're being like this excessive Extra. like yo that guy's unnecessary bro 
He wants to do a sitcom with three cameras. Three cameras? That's never been done before. It's like, that's the fucking standard, bro. <laughs> like, that's been a lot of my, like, fights in the last 18 months of going. You want stuff to be on the proper level? Yeah, I want this shit. Yo, can we do this shit right? And everyone's just like, yep, that guy's, that guy's fucking crazy. Did you hear what he asked for? He you asked for a script. You don't want to be duct taping shit <laughs> yeah. together? Yeah, who is this dickhead? Uh, he asked for like... And that's the thing you got to accept. I think South Africans... Should, but shout out to you for making the most out of really garbage circumstances. <laughs> and <laughs> but, so t that's TV. That's my journey. And uh, yeah, I just, I'm still making shit. I, I write in a lot of stuff. I've written for a lot of TV. Um, and what do you mean? Like jokes or like scripts? Scripts, scripts. Like so we, so we've got, we got Bantu Hour, Safta Amman, Safta nominated LNN Emmy nominated Comics Choice Award for writing um boys written like you know there's lots of great writers out there that people don't necessarily know of so I just recently wrote, wrote a show called Black Tax that's, that'll be dropping on BET oh snap soon um I worked on like some advertising campaigns recently that I can't mention yet I like worked on the the uh Flieg in the Springbokki for I haven't even heard of that. Yeah, Hannes Brummer brought us in to oh, write no, on Hannes. that. Yeah, Hannes is great. So, but that that we were doing more narrative stuff and getting ideas. Okay. Well, um, yeah, because that's what I was thinking. Like, so, like, how much of your writing is like stories, and how much of it is actual pinpointed jokes, and like. So a lot, a lot of what's been happening recently is like people bring me in. So uh, here's what. Like, he, are you there for punch ups or? Yeah. So a lot of my work is like repeat work. So basically, what I try to do whenever I have a new opportunity is make sure like I'm, I. I I leave a really good impression. I'm, I try to make myself easy to work with. I try to be really good at what I do. I'm working on being punctual, um, but but luckily I've I've done well enough. Out of those. out of the three things, that's the one I'm probably the best. At. Being punctual, showing up on time, I've learned has been like just the easiest way to gain people's trust. Bob, you were late today. You are telling that people about that wasn't my fault. Yeah, of yes. course, yes, but and also why why are you telling people that? This nah. is. I, I'm all about transparency. <laughs> but in general, yeah. I'm pretty punctual. So I, if you're paying me, I'll be there on time. Yeah. So so whenever I get a new opportunity, I try and knock it out the park and try, you know. Again, goes back to Amy Polar. What's your currency? My currency is funny. So when I'm in a room, I'm going to show you I'm fucking funny. So I'll work on projects with people and they'll, they'll ring me back. And so I worked on the roast battle of uh, AKA... Um, it must have been quite fun. Uh, yeah, it, well, it's difficult, man. It's difficult. I worked on, I, I did punch ups on the previous roast of Somizi. I came in a little bit later. But, like, people know, like, you know, I think I add some kind of value to the experience. Um, but, yeah, it's like, just be good at the thing. Like, I always say to people, particularly younger acts, be so good they can't ignore you. Uh, and it's not like about being better than anyone. It's just like, just add value in, in the room. We should never doubt why the person's there. No one should look across and be like, who, who invited that guy? With anything you do in life, don't, like, don't make us question your place in the circle. <laughs> but do you never question your place in the circle? I'm sure I have. I'm sure I've had imposter syndrome for a long time. Where I was like, You're sure you have? Yeah, but I have. Let me say I have. Okay. Let me not be. <laughs> but, but you're not really suffering that much from it at the moment? Because, like, talking to you now, like, you seem to know where you're at. Yeah. Now it's, um, I think, it, like, that kind of thing will maybe creep in for, like, bigger things. Where I'm like, can I, <sighs> I don't know. It's, like, it's, it's weird because all, like, stand-ups inherently, like, just fucking believe they're the shit see i like that's the thing i don't believe that i think like there's a handful of stand-ups that believe that they're the shit but i think everyone else is just projecting <laughs> no i mean like for you to get up on stage and think people will laugh at your jokes that people you've never met there's an element of like there's an element of confidence in that that like general public doesn't have sure but it's also there's a need for the approval which is why you do that almost it's this weird balance of like I'm the shit, or am I the shit? I'm the shit. Am I the shit? Yes. Like, oh yeah, of course. It's like it's a back and forth process, but the 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 the, the first step is going. I I think I can do this. Yeah, and that's <laughs> th that's the psychology that I think very few people can understand or yeah. get into. Like I think I think I okay. can. Don't you get annoyed? Like everyone's like, I could never do what you do. 
Yeah, I mean, I don't know. Some people, I think some people can. I, I encourage everybody to try stand up once in your life. In your life, just, just feel it out, see what it's like. Because I've tried a lot of shit. I'm a person who likes to try stuff. I played field hockey once, a disaster. Mm, I used to. <laughs> Forgot I was wearing pads and turned, got hit in the thigh with a fucking hockey ball. I played <laughs> rugby, I all kinds of shit. So try, just try. Like, there's no shame in failing. Um, I mean, doing doing something with finesse is hard. Yeah. Doing something is easy. Doing something with finesse is, that's what separates people. Is like, uh, is your ability and your capability to do something and how you make it look. A good act, a good act musician makes it look like they're playing that's what i always say that like i don't I, I don't like do gigs it's like where i would say to people where are you playing like it just the connotation makes it a little bit more fun of an experience you're trying not to think of this thing as work or grind no i'm yo i'm not here to grind if anyone's listening don't grind you're wasting your time that's how you fuck up your knees don't grind like just work. <laughs> was that a skateboarding joke? Oh <laughs> what, just whatever it is. Don't grind. Just work. Just work. Work to become efficient at what you do. Rest. Sleep. Fucking drink water. Hang out with your friends. And enjoy your day-to-day -day experiences. That's a big thing for me. I like to tell people like... Like I, just, I live so that I can do what I want during the day. Amen. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I, I don't have to be anywhere after this. My next thingy is in like what time is it now? It's in three and a half hours, right? And then, and that's it. And then my next thing. I mean, it is December, so things are being tied up. I'm like, okay. And then and then two shoots next week. I should still work in between, like write and shit. But like like I want I want to. The the thing I value now more than ever is my time. Because I think I think a lot of it has been I've stolen it from myself over the last few years, and people have stolen it from us without them knowing, and we've allowed them to steal it from us. And so, to everybody listening, safeguard your time, and and I think you'll have a good time. Sweet, I think we can end things right there. So it's a fucking hectic way to end the uh, podcast. How's that a hectic way? Like I like ending on a a moment, you yes. know, on a profound statement. So that was a profound statement. Thank you. And moisturize. And moisturize. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> Drink water.